Good morning, Vaughn Park Church, and welcome to our Sunday morning auditorium class, Sunday, August the 16th. It's a beautiful Lord's Day, a great day to study God's Word together, and we hope that you would feel like assembling with us at 11 for our corporate worship. We need everybody to be there. We need the body to be assembled together. In our class, we've been studying or talking about uh, the preacher search that we're going through right now. And uh, we're nearing, we feel like, in perhaps the end of that search, or at least the end of our time with uh, interim ministry partners. And uh, we have decided to serve over to back in March that we, we want a man in our pulpit who will preach the word. We've gone through these statistics for the last couple of weeks. But, um, and what we've been talking about first and second Timothy and Titus, and we've said that these are the pastoral epistles written to preachers. Timothy, remember, for the first letter was in Ephesus while Paul was uh, in, in between his Roman imprisonments. Uh, Titus was on the island of Crete, and he wrote these letters to them that they might be able to be better equipped to work with the churches there. And then while Paul was in prison the second time before he was executed for the faith of Jesus Christ, he wrote Second Timothy. But these letters talk about um, preachers and preaching and how they should work in and around uh, with the church. So we'll be looking at some things about the, the preachers and what they would expect a preacher to do. And this morning I'd like to look at the job description. Job descriptions are something that are written out relatively new. I mean, they've been around for several years, but I remember when we just understood what our job was. In fact, when I began preaching about 50 years ago, the uh, job description is pretty simple. Preach twice on Sunday, teach a Sunday school class, Wednesday night class, and uh, do everything else that was involved, uh, preaching weddings and funerals and things like that. Of course, 50 years ago, I hadn't didn't have to do any of that. Weddings and funeral type stuff, but um, that which was fine with me. I, I did do a few uh, as a teenager, but still, or that is the funerals, but still that was kind of understood. It wasn't written down, and they, they hired me to preach two sermons on Sunday, teach classes like that. And uh, the little church there, and probably they're, they're probably more listening and watching right now uh, to, to this uh, Zoom call or this uh, meeting of this class period right now. They're probably more listening now and watching now than it was in the church then when I started preaching. On a good Sunday, we'd have 20, 23. Uh, one of the brethren got his brother and his son to start coming. Our tennis went up to 33. I remember on Easter, my family came, had a few other local visitors come. We had right at 50 people there. We thought we had a crowd. We actually used the other side of the church building that day, which uh, was rather unusual. And there were some days when I got there that I was the only man. I had to do all the announcements, lead all the singing, lead all the prayers, serve the Lord's Supper, um, and do the preaching. And there was one a young boy there whose mind wasn't... Um, Okay, he was sixth grade in age with first grade in, in his mind. And he could help pass the plates, but you have to point and direct and coach him along. But um, that's as, as good as he, he could do. So it was, it was an interesting and fun situation 50 years ago. Of course, churches have changed. It's a little old, old country church. Um, but um, when we look at Vaughn Park, the, the elders sat down and we worked out a job description for uh, our new minister. We've had one for years for, in fact, all the ministers have a job description, but what is expected of them might not be ever conveyed more than just this right here to, to the congregation. So uh, our Vaughn Park job description for our ministry will be to serve as a primary preaching minister. You say, well, well that's given. Yes, but it's best if it's written down. Uh, and when you think of preacher, you think of the preaching minister. But this uh, involves not just preaching on Sunday, but the ensuring that in his absence, that a quality lesson is presented by a quality presenter. Uh, and he works with the other ministers in, in planning and preparing uh, the sermons. And I remember I was taught when I was growing up that it's best to, to plan the whole year's sermons. And I would sit down November or December and, and spend some time, maybe a couple of days, uh, working on what I'm going to preach the next year. I would go Sunday by Sunday. I'd list Sunday morning, Sunday night. I might do a series on the minor prophets on Sunday night, and maybe a series on the 
parables of Jesus on Sunday morning or maybe the miracles of Jesus later uh, in the year. You'd highlight Mother's Day and Father's Day and be sure that uh, Valentine's Day, what was taking care of, basically landed on Sunday. And of course, Christmas and you know, other things that might come up uh, that need to be mentioned or honored or respected. I was always in pencil because you never knew what might happen that might change what you were going to do. Uh, for example, if, you had, if I had planned a, a lesson on happiness and joy in the Lord, and that week one of our members passed away and the funeral was Sunday afternoon, that's probably not a good time to present that kind of lesson. So it, it was tempered with, with what was going on, but not only in the church, but also in, in the world around us. So, so that's the, the, the primary job of the ministry. Secondly, to provide pastoral care with participation by the elders and other ministers. Pastoral care is something that is, um, what's the right word to say this? It's, it's misunderstood, misapplied, misappropriated by a lot of people. I've worked with uh, churches where they believed that if they were sick, the preacher had to come see them. That's what they thought the preacher's job was. Now, it didn't matter that they never told the preacher that they were sick, but he was supposed to just know that. I had uh, one fellow tell me one time that what you need to do is go to the hospital every day during visiting hours and just walk up and down the halls. If the door was open, go inside and visit with the people and such. I'm thinking visiting hours are from 10 to 4. When do I prepare my lessons? He said, well, that's beside the point. No, that's the primary point. Uh, pastoral care is not to be done by the preacher. It's by everybody in the church, by the elders and other ministers, as well as, as each. And I think we do, as a membership, we do a pretty good job of this, of caring for one another. Just looking at the prayer requests that come in, that people send in for loved ones in the church, as well as loved ones in the family. And we work to provide the pastoral care. But that's not just visiting the sick and, and at home or in the hospital. But it's also involved with uh, caring for them when they go through a, a grief process, when someone has passed away in the family, or when uh, they're struggling spiritually. Uh, and and the, involved in this is the realization that there are things that the preacher can't handle. There needs to be a professional counselor involved. And the minister is, is encouraged to uh, refer those people to a more professional counselor. And that's all part of this pastoral care. A third point is the, the teaching. We would expect our minister to spend time in teaching in Sunday school, Wednesday night or Sunday morning or both. And uh, we've got to have it uh, these days where a sermon on Sunday and one class on Wednesday may be a load for the minister. Uh, and I realize it takes a lot of time to prepare that, those many lessons because uh, I did that for years. In fact, for a while I was teaching school, I had three or four preparations to teach Bible at school as well as sermons and, and classes, but in all that preparation, there is also a lot of overlap. So as you study for one, you realize things that you want to mention or bring up in the other lesson. And all these work together hand in hand and are beneficial one to the other. But that's kind of the job description as we talk about our minister teaching. But also the idea of self-development and continuing education. The minister needs to be reading books and not just uh, reading whatever's caught off the press and the top 10 bestsellers in the nation or something like that, but rather reading things that will develop his knowledge of the scripture, his uh, understanding of people, his work, his ability to work and deal with, with people and how to grow the church. Uh, I remember when I began preaching, I would attend the lectureships and go to seminars, go to conferences and such, um, go visit other, of course, back then we had gospel meetings. Go and visit other churches and listen to other preachers and learn from them and see how they did things, how they presented their lessons and took notes, uh, as well as working on, on a graduate degree. And of course, that takes time, but that's expected of a minister. And it's, it's, it's a sad commentary on any of us, any individual to think, well, I have arrived. I, I can't learn anymore. I don't need to learn anymore. I don't need to change the way I'm doing things. The way I'm doing it is just, just fine and dandy. And for some things that might be true, but there are other things where we have to continue to develop and grow, not just uh, intellectually, but spiritually, and, and our knowledge of the word and, and knowledge of people that we deal with. So that's all involved 
in the job description of the ministry. But you ask, how does, uh, of course, all of this should say, all of this works together to accomplish our vision and our mission. So whatever our ministry does, all of this is working together to bring about, accomplish our vision and our mission. And if you remember, we talked about this, our vision for the Vaughan Park Church is that we are living for him, speaking about him, and serving in his name. And there's a lot of ways where all of these re responsibilities and the jobs of the minister fit into our mission. But you ask, how does this fit into our study of the pastoral epistles? What does the preacher's job description that we have written out have to do with this study? Well, you remember those trustworthy statements we mentioned a couple of weeks ago? Said so there are five of them in First and Second Timothy and Titus. And the first of those we talked about in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. That means everybody should accept this. Everyone can trust in this statement. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. Jesus came to save sinners. Now, the only person that Jesus did not need to save was himself. He was sinless. Everybody else, from Adam to the judgment day, is guilty of sin. Paul says in Romans 3, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all fell short of what God expects of us. But then you keep reading in Romans, he says, but God commended his love for us, chapter 5, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came to the world to save us. And that's part of the minister's job. It's also part of our job to work together as a body of Christ to save sinners. The second trustworthy statement we've skipped. It's in chapter 3, 1 Timothy. If a man desires the office of, a, of an overseer, an elder, and that's a trustworthy statement. And, and there are listed the qualifications or qualities that an elder should have. The third one is this one. That we looked at last week. It's a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance. And we say, well, that's just one verse. What's the statement? You back up to verse 8. Godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Godliness is profitable. And I asked you last week, and I hope you did, take some time to consider what is the promise that godliness holds for us now and for the life to come. And if you're expecting me to answer today, you're wrong. I'm not going to do that. I hope you'll do that on your own. Continue your study in these letters of, of Paul. Today, let's look at the, at the fourth of these statements. It's a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. This statement that Paul makes in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, is, is just packed full of concepts that we need to hold dear to our hearts. Uh, first of all, we've died with Christ. If we have died with him, Paul says, we shall live with him. But look up to, back up to Romans chapter 6. Well, Paul says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And, of course, the, the evident answer is, is no, of course not. It may never be, he says in verse 2. How shall we who have died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We have died with Christ. Now, normally, when something is dead, we like to bury it and leave it there. So we have died to sin and we're buried with Christ in baptism. And thus we leave uh, the sin that we've died to there. And we're raised to walk a new life. If we have died with Christ, we'll live with him. Look at Colossians 3, beginning with verse 1. If you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things which are above. For Christ is, seating at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, 
and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. We have died with Christ. And here are precious promises that because we died to sin, been buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk a new life with him, we shall, at the judgment day, be allowed to live and to reign with Christ. The second phrase, we endure. Paul says, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. But you back up to verse 10, Paul says, for this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. We endure for those who are the chosen ones, for those who have been chosen by God. Now, if you go back and you read and study first, uh, or rather Ephesians, Paul talks about how that chosen choosing has been done. Those who choose Christ, God chooses. Those who've chosen to obey the gospel are chosen by God. There are some who think that God made before creation. He made a list of all those who are going to be saved. Some believe there's only 144,000 who are going to go to heaven. And if you remember our study of the book of Revelation, we've demonstrated that would be untrue. But uh, there are many who believe that, well, if, if God has picked you to be saved, then there's nothing you can do about it. And uh, if you are saved, God's picked you, and there's nothing you can do to be lost. Uh, that's not in keeping with what the Scripture teaches. But we need to endure for the sake of the chosen one. Peter says in 1 Peter 4 and verse 16, If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not feel ashamed, but in that name let him glorify God. When I see, when we see, when you see someone enduring something, maybe suffering through uh, a dealing with cancer or dealing with surgery or having overcome a significant problem in their life, uh, be it uh, what, whatever it might be. When we see that they have gone into that and come out of it, we realize they endured and we're encouraged by the fact that they did endure. So we endure for the sake of the chosen. Not that we're bragging because we look at someone go through that and we say, well, hey, if they can do that, I can. They set an example that I can follow. Remember, Jesus set an example that we should follow in the steps. He endured so that we can see by his example that we can endure. When you think of what Paul suffered, what Peter suffered, what the other apostles suffered for the sake of Christ, if they can endure, we can endure. If they can go through it, we can go through it. And Hebrews chapter 11, that roll call of faith, basically has one basic fundamental thought. By faith, these people serve God. By faith, these people endure. When you think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, telling Nebuchadnezzar, throw us in that fire furnace. In fact, you get your guys out of the way, we'll take a run and start, and we'll jump in. And if our God saves us, that's fine. If he doesn't save us, that's fine. But we're not going to worship your image. They endure as an example for us. And think of Daniel. The decree came out, you cannot pray. Three times a day, Daniel continued to pray. The old spiritual says, Daniel, he was a good man. Lord, he prayed three times a day. The angels would heist their windows just to hear what Daniel had to say. Daniel didn't care. He was going to serve God. And when we look at him in the lion's den, we think, well, if, if he can go through that, I can go through something similar. So we endure for the chosen. And Hebrews 11 kind of concludes in chapter 12, where the Hebrew writer says, we are surrounded by great cloud of witnesses who basically are saying we made it through you can make it through so we endure for the chosen and if we endure we shall reign with him but if we deny him he will deny us in matthew 10 verse 32 and 33 jesus said if any man will confess me before men i will confess him before the father in heaven now think about that for just a moment Jesus will turn to the eternal God Father and say, this is one of mine. In Matthew 25, he says, come you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom. Why? Because in essence, you confess me by your life, by your living. Back to Matthew 10, Jesus continued that passage by saying, if any man denies me before men, I'll deny him before the Father in heaven. 
We said, wait a minute. Peter denied Jesus three times. Yes, he did. And Jesus forgave us. We can be forgiven. But if we live in denial of Christ, we will stand before God being denied by him. Paul says in Romans 10, with the mouth confessions made to salvation. We confess before men, but with the heart there's belief involved. And so that faith that's involved in our confession, that I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And it's not just something I say, but it's a life that I live that demonstrates that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 9, because Jesus Christ humbled himself to death on the cross. Verse 9, Paul says, God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul here indicates that there is going to be a point I believe it's at the judgment day when every person who ever lived from Adam to the judgment day will kneel before the almighty God and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The problem is those who in this life have denied Jesus will make that confession of faith too late. There'll be a point in time where they cannot turn back, where they cannot change their life. And once we have passed from this life into the next, folks, it's over. If we have lived for Christ now, we'll live with Christ then. That's what this passage is saying. If we de deny Christ now, he will deny us then. And, and that's the issue. Every knee shall bow. You can do it now or you can do it later. And it's better for our salvation if we confess Jesus now. But the trustworthy statement continues. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Our Jesus Christ is faithful. In Hebrews 10 and verse 23, the Hebrew writer says, Let us hold fast the profession, the confession of our hope. Those two words go hand in hand there. Because, he says, he who promised is faithful. Jesus made a promise, and he will keep his promise. I just listened to a, a series of books uh, about uh, a fellow who moved to Dakota from Texas and uh, found a gold mine, set up a hardware store, and his whole family had the reputation, if they made a promise, they would keep it. Everybody believed, regardless if you liked the guy or not, if he made a promise, he was faithful to keep that promise. And it's, it's hard to find people today who will keep their promises like that. But it's not hard to find Jesus keeping a promise. Every promise God through Jesus has ever made will be kept. You can bank on that, as we used to say. In 1 John chapter 1, in verse 9, John makes the comment about the faithfulness of Jesus. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us. He's faithful. And he will also cleanse us of all our unrighteousness. And you remember when we studied Revelation, verse 11, chapter 19, John says, I saw a great white horse in heaven, and the one who sat upon it, uh, heaven and earth fled away, and he was called faithful and true. Jesus is the faithful and true. He's the one who is faithful and true. He cannot deny himself. How many of us got it this morning? Walked into the bathroom, looked in the mirror and said, oh, wait, that's not my face. Oh, wait a minute, that's not my hair. No, even though some of us may have to sneak up on the mirror, that, that mirror is faithful. That's, that's us. That's who we are. My mother used to tell me it looked like the rats played in my hair. Maybe your hair looked like that this morning when you got up. But it's yours. And you walk away from that mirror and you take your body with you. We can't look at our hands and say, hey, that's not my hand. What's it doing into my arm? We cannot deny that 
our physical body is ours. We cannot deny ourselves like that. Jesus is faithful. He cannot deny himself. He will not deny his body. And if we have been buried with Christ, we've died to sin, we're buried with Christ, we're actually becoming a member of his body. And he will not deny his body, which is the church, of which we are individual members. So back to this statement in 2 Timothy 2. It is a trustworthy statement. If we have died with Christ, we will live with him. If we endure for Christ, we shall reign with him. That doesn't mean we're going to have a crown and we'll have authority. It just means we're going to be a part of his kingdom. And what else could we desire? If we deny him now, he'll deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. But you turn those around to the positive. If we confess him, he'll confess us. If we are faithful, he'll be faithful to us. So I urge you to think of the comments or the, the ideas behind this trustworthy statement that we've died with Christ to live with him. We endure for Christ for the chosen so we can reign with him and them. We're faithful to him and we're confessing. So in that way, folks, in essence, we are living for him, speaking about him, and serving in his name. I hope you have a very blessed day and beg you to please continue in prayer for Vaughn Park, for our elders, and for our new teacher. God bless our church. Would you pray for that? Thank you so much.